And now I have to announce our speaker for the session. Everyone likes to tinker with electronics. I think at least everyone who is here in the room. And it becomes harder and harder because a few years ago you did soldering of through the whole components and everything was easier and things got smaller and smaller. Now you need a microscope and strange and ex extremely costly equipment to build things. And it's hard for a hacker front to keep up. We have to keep pushing the limits. And our speaker, Hans, will tell you how to keep pushing the limits. So please give a warm welcome to Hans. Well, hello, everyone. Um, so let's push the limits together. And um, we also need to push the tempo a bit because it's quite a lot of content. And that's why I might skip some details, but you can read them later uh, on the slides once you need them. So, um, more sophisticated do it yourself electronics, why do we need this or why do we want this? Well, the professional electronics obviously get more and more sophisticated and we need to keep up. Um, you can do really great stuff um, nowadays, even with do it yourself. Um, for example, you can build high-speed FPGA boards with more than one gigabytes per second RAM throughput. You can do, use those as software-defined radios and um, logic analyzers you can build, uh, build on your own. Uh, you can build custom networking equipment, for example, ARM-based routers uh, with gigabit Ethernet interfaces um, and so on. Um, now, what are the challenges for do-it-yourself projects? Well, one point, of course, is that um, the ICs we nowadays have um, get more advanced and um, mostly they don't have leads anymore. So, um, if you look at your batch, there's the ARM controller on this and it doesn't have leads, you cannot solder it with a soldering iron any longer. Um, this is a ball grid array package. It has tiny solder balls underneath the package and um, you need an oven or something like this for. And um, this is done because it saves precious PCB space. You need those PCB space in uh, the cell phones, of course, and in other devices as well. So you can uh, pack more IOs per, um, per space. Yeah, this, it's uh, similar for QFN packages. These are very, um, uh, yeah, very small, and um, you cannot easily um, use a soldering iron for those. Um, so this, of course, is a challenge, the chips themselves. Um, then there's boards with four or more layers. Um, we need those due to the high number of signals. Um, otherwise, we cannot access all the signals that we need. Um, we need other soldering techniques. Um, and this often means reflow soldering. Um, we need also high me uh, mechanical precision. Um, for the assembly, because um, the mechanical tolerances are quite narrow and we have to work very precisely. Um, we also have faster buses and interfaces. Um, for example, DDR buses and PCI Express, for example, um, HDMI and so on. Um, these are fast signals and the layout is much more demanding for those, of course. Um, the professionals have expensive software for this, and we also need better software or more time um, to compensate for this. And um, we also um, need more know-how, or yeah, you need more know-how if you don't have expensive software. Um, in this talk, I'll give some general hints first, um, then we'll have a look at soldering options um, with solder paste and how to assemble a board. Um, We'll have a look at high-speed buses and interfaces. Um, then we'll have a look at multi-layer boards. Um, first, we need to understand a bit why we, um, um, what are important things we need um, when designing a multi-layer board. And afterwards, we'll have a brief look at design software. Um, most of you probably already using Eagle. Yeah. Um, so. Um, some general hints first. Uh, it's generally a good idea to make a tiny test board for risky parts of your design. For example, if you want to try your first DDR memory, um, it's not wise to build a real complex board around this uh, if, you don't, if you don't know if this 
um, will work. So make a tiny design, just test the complex um, part first, and um, you might want to patch some signals later, so this means outer layers are better, of course. Then um, you, can, you should use um, electroless nickel gold um, finish for the boards because you really need this for fine pitch and BGAs because um, the other option is hell hot air leveling. Um, this is basically um, solder that is um, shoved across the board with hot air and this is an, a rather uneven surface and this is bad for BGAs and fine pitch of course um, because some balls might uh, still hang in the air then. Um, we need a higher soldering temperature for um, PB free. Usually it's 237 degrees Celsius, and um, the maximum temperature for the uh, most of the chips is 260 degrees. Um, so we have a rather narrow margin there. And yeah, then um, another thing is some people uh, do the PGAs um, just with um, with flux and without soldering paste. I tried this a few times and it worked four times, but it didn't work for one board. Um, so I'm no longer using that. I'm using solder paste for BGAs now. Um, it's still uh, possible to fix those boards with hot air, um, but I think with paste um, it's um, better. Yeah. Um, then the popcorn effect um, is something you need to consider. Um, the thing is, humidity from the um, room will get into the chips if you leave them in the open. And once you heat those chips, um, the water will boil and vapor will be created and it will blow your package like popcorn. And that's why um, you get expensive or um, complex chips like PGAs in sealed pouches. Um, there's a um, desiccant and indicator paper in there, um, and you can reseal those um, pouches with the adhesive tape um, after you put the chips back in and the desiccant, and usually this is fine. And um, you can see it's, um, if it's not fine um, by looking at the indicator paper. Then you have to bake the chips. Yeah. Um, here's a simple test board I created um, just for DDR2 RAM and an FPGA. Here you can see the DDR2 RAM and the FPGA. I also added an HDMI connector, which I connected to the FPGA. Apart from that, yeah, there's JTAG uh, chip, some GPIOs, and um, yeah, voltage regulators, more wires than necessary. Um, but yeah, um, I tested it and it did work with 800 megahertz, although the FPGA was only rated for 600. So yeah, this was a success and I continued. Um, um, for the soldering, you have basically three options. The first option is using a, ref a reflow oven. Um, a lot of people are using modified pizza ovens there, but you need more heat and uh, temperature control for this. Um, because the yeah the pizza ovens don't have sufficient heating power by themselves, then you can order um, cheap reflow ovens from China. Uh, we'll have a look at that, but you need to modify those ovens because they are well they are cheap. And um, a problem with reflow soldering is that you have black surfaces on the ICs usually, and also on the connectors, and they absorb more infrared radiation um, from the quartz lamps and um, while the metal surfaces mostly reflect this heat. And because of this, the temperature on the PCB varies with the location and it gets reflected at those points where we actually need them and the chips heat up more. Um, that's not good, but yeah, we have to deal with that. Um, hot air gun with a hot plate is also an option. Um, there are cheap hot air guns available and the problem is you do not know if the balls underneath the BGA already melted. And with larger copper areas, it's also difficult to get sufficient heat in uh, just from the air, so you need a preheater. And for preheating, you can simply use a hot plate, a normal cooking plate, and um, set them to 100, 220, 150 might also be okay. Um, degrees Celsius, just check it all the time with an infrared thermometer on the PCB surface, and you can also solder this way. Um, vapor phase is a really great thing, um, but you need a special liquid which boils at um, exactly the soldering temperature. Um, it's a really good heat transfer uh, because um, the PCB rests in the vapor phase and is not immersed in the liquid. 
So overheat, overheating the ICs is very difficult, but if it really does get too hot, uh, very bad things will happen because hydrofluoric acid will be produced and you don't want that in your house. Um, so you should look this up if you really want to go this way. Um, there are do-it-yourself projects. The liquid is very expensive, uh, but you, um, you have to buy a, a liter or so uh, in the beginning or half a liter, but um, for this would be sufficient for quite a lot of um, runs. Yeah. Um, you also should use a high pot so the vapor doesn't get out of it. Um, so when we use a reflow oven, um, a real reflow oven, the cheapest one usually is the T962 from China. Um, it has a very small holding capacity, it's about one euro board or so. Um, but it has very high heating power compared to the place. And this is often a problem with the pizza ovens. Um, there's an ARM7 controller in it, which isn't read protected. So you can simply dump the firmware. I did this and I reverse engineered, uh, reverse engineered it because it um, made the boards too hot. And yeah, I did a test run first and this board was completely unusable afterwards. Um, so I wrote my own firmware um, and the temperature controller is implemented on a PC. Um, it's just connected to the oven using 3.3 volts RS232 and there are just a few comments for heating and running the fan and reading the temperature. Um, the host code is done in Lua. This is rather easy to adapt and you can also easily add new temperature profiles. Um, it's a tiny firmware, you can run it completely from the RAM, so you do not have to erase um, the original firmware. And um, yeah, the, I put the code online so you can have a look at it. Um, the problem is the documentation is missing right now. Um, yeah, but uh, I'll try to add it later. If you um, need it before, you can simply ask me. Um, so, when using the T962 oven, you should replace the masking tapes that's um, used in it with Kapton tape because the masking tape isn't heat resistant and it will smell a lot. Um, then for my alternative firmware, you need um, pin headers for RX and 2X obviously, uh, TX obviously. You need external reset and a boot button so you can um, access the bootloader. And you should also add pull-up resistors for the triax because those triax turn on the fan and the heating. And those will be on while you're in the bootloader if you don't add those pull-ups. Um, then I'm using um, screw nuts as spacers for the PCB, so the PCB rests on those spacers and um, it gets a bit um, better temperature profile there because um, at the bottom it's um, not, there's not sufficient heat here. Um, I measure, also measure the temperature directly on the PCB. You can see the sensor here. Um, this is a K-type sensor and it's placed here directly on the PCB. And um, those K-type sensors, they are very well suited for high temperatures and you should do some test runs first because it won't work um, out of the box. You need some time and patience. Yeah, There's um, more projects um, regarding this and there's also some documentation. Um, some is in German, there's probably English one on the net as well. Um, so I already did you show you this photo? Here you can see the cable coming out of the oven with a serial USB cable attached. Um, here's the board resting on the screw nuts. And this is an interesting thing. The, um, these are the, um, the waves um, that you use for the reflow profile. This is actually a wave for Xilinx FPGAs. And um, unfortunately, the description is in German. So the red one is the temperature that we want. Um, the green one is the temperature of the PCB. And the blue one is the air temperature. So you can see that the air temperature first is a lot higher than, or a bit higher than the PCB. And at about 160 degrees, that changes. The air uh, temperature actually then is quite a bit lower than the PCB temperature. And that's why we want to measure the PCB temperature. The oven by itself just measures the air temperature with two sensors. So you can simply rewire one and uh, put it on the PCB. Yeah. Um, for those reflow ovens, you want to use solder paste. The solder paste you put on the uh, pads of the uh, SMD parts. A solder paste under the microscope looks like this. Um, there are tiny solder balls embedded in flux and um, 
you also need a stencil for fine pitch and PGA. So stencil is basically a stainless steel mask um, with openings in it, and you force the solder paste through those openings, and it gets on this pa uh, the pads, and it stays there. Yeah. Um, then some um, board houses offer free stencils for your boards, and others don't. And sometimes it's um, cheaper to just order a dummy uh, single layer board with a free stencil than um, ordering an uh, expensive stencil from another board house. Yeah. Um, this is what it looks like when dealing with soldering paste. So um, here you can see the, uh, the stencil. It's placed here above a PCB, which I already had beneath it. Here's some masking tape I used to fix those things. Here is the, um, yeah, the, the soldering paste. And um, here you can see uh, some fixing parts. Um, for fixing the board, it must be really tight. And those fixing parts you can order from the web or you can make them yourselves. I just ordered them from... Um, from better layout, those are the PCB pool um, people. Um, it's not very expensive, and um, the good thing about this is that it's made from um, normal PCBs, so the height of this um, already matches your PCB then. And you can simply um, yeah, um, align it then. Um, then you put some uh, solder paste here, um, and with this you smear it across the stencil and Afterwards, it'll be on all the pads, and you can uh, place your components. Um, you need to fix this stuff really firmly, so um, you don't move the stencil around um, while printing. And um, the fixing kits, I already mentioned that. You need to stir the paste uh, really good and uh, before using it, and you should keep it in the refrigerator. It will be good for about one year. Um, if a tiny paste droplet covers two adjacent pads, it's, this is not always a problem. Um, sometimes you can just ignore this. Um, yeah, and you need some sort of feeling for this. It's, this is a bit hard to uh, describe. Um, but usually, if it's um, if the if it's a, just a tiny amount, it's not a problem because the uh, it will flow to where it's needed and where it should be. Um, Cleaning the stencil um, is a lot more difficult than one might imagine because the solder paste is, is quite yeah um, sticky. And um, I tried ethanol and isopropanol, and, um, but the best thing I found with household chemicals is lighter fluid. And there are some special cleaning fluids available as well, but lighter fluid really works very well. Um, you can also use this to clean the PCB um, if you messed up the, um, the print somehow, and you can then start over. You can also clean the components, usually. Um, you should wear a lab coat because this rather messy paste and um, will get everywhere, and um, getting this out of your clothes again is uh, quite a challenge. Uh, yeah. So um, when you place and align the parts, um, this is often uh, a challenge as well. Um, you should start by placing um, the most challenging parts. These are obviously BGAs and QFNs, and do the easy parts later. This way, um, if you mess up with the um, challenging parts, um, you cannot easily fix this, and you need to remove everything and um, clean it and start over again. So that's why you want to do the most challenging parts first, um, because then you can start over with a minimal time overhead. Um, when designing your board, you should add a uh, place a rectangle around the chip in the silk screen of the board for BGAs and QFNs, because that way um, the initial alignment um, is much more easy. Yeah. And, um, yeah, well, then you can use a tweezer for picking and placing the chips. Um, vacuum tweezers, um, you should only use those with electric pumps because the other ones will lose their vacuum in about 10 seconds and the chip will drop somewhere. Um, then gently place the um, chip on the solder paste and then you can still align it a bit. Um, after aligning it, carefully inspect it. Um, I usually use an off-the-shelf magnifying glass and inspect it from different sides and different angles so that um, it really matches um, the, 
the alignment in the silk screen very well. Um, but I, with QFNs, you can also have a look at the pads from the outside. And once you're satisfied this, uh, with this, you should push it slightly down because that way, if you move the board around, um, it'll stay in place. Um, I did a um, tiny placement helper for Eagle. Um, this is hacked together. Um, yeah, and um, it's done in Lua. It needs Lua XML and LGI. Um, LGI is Lua G object introspection, so it's, it's a wrapper for all the G, um, glib and G objects and GTK. Um, and that makes it quite different um, to use on Windows. I don't think anyone has, has now, to this day, successfully used LGI on Windows. Um, I don't know about OS X. Um, the code you can get here, um, the use, usage is rather simple. You just invoke it with the, um, yeah, with the, um, with the board as an argument. So um, it's easy to use once you manage to install the required uh, things. And it basically translates the Eagle XML calls into Cairo calls. Um, it requires quite some RAM because it uses one Cairo surface in RGB 32 bit um, per layer because Cairo doesn't offer um, indexed uh, palettes as far as I've seen. Um, but well, with nowadays hardware, it is doable. Um, it looks like this. Here you can see the board. Um, and here you can see the, the elements. You can um, switch to the layers tab and turn off uh, layers, um, individual, uh, turn off individual layers, and um, there are shortcuts for top and bottom and so on. And you can scroll around here and switch to the values. It also shows the values down here. And it highlights all the uh, places where this component um, should be placed. Um, you can also mirror along the X or uh, Epsilon axis. Um, because, um, yeah, it's useful if you turn the board around and want to place the uh, bottom side. Um, okay, then high-speed buses and interfaces um, are the next challenge. Um, we need a good signal integrity for um, high-speed signals. And this is a challenge um, because of two things. Um, the first thing is we need length matching. so. Um, if you have several signals that should arrive at more or less the same time at the receiver, um, you need to do length matching. That means um, the, the tracks on the PCB need to be about the same length so that the signals arrive at more or less the same time. Um, here an interesting thing is that the propagation speed or the propagation delay um, depends on the dielectric constant, the epsilon r of the insulator. This is basically the FR4 board. Um, and here's a rule of thumb that um, it takes about six picoseconds for a signal uh, to travel one millimeter on top or bottom or seven picoseconds um, per millimeter on the inner layers. Um, so the signals in the inner layers are approximately 20% slower than on top and bottom. And this is something um, you need to consider when doing the length matching. Eagle does not respect that, um, and it doesn't consider wires either. So wires are usually 1.6 millimeters, and um, if you use the length matching tool in Eagle, it doesn't um, add the length of wires. Yeah. Um, another thing is, usually um, you want to place the termination resistors after the last receiver. And with Eagle, you cannot measure the, um, tra uh, the track length between two chips. You can just see the uh, complete track length. Yeah? But um, what you need actually is the, the distance from the sender to the receiver. So um, if the lines continue to the termination resistors, you don't want to measure this. Um, Another thing is um, that you need characteristic impedance for the transmission lines. And for this, you need special mu uh, multi-layer stack ups. And um, you need to design the width of those PCB tracks depending on your multi-layer stack up. Um, there's a uh, length matching tool for Eagle, which I did. It looks like this. Um, you can basically give it two. Um, the names of two ICs or two connectors or something like that, and, um, and pa one parameter, um, and it gives you the, the time those signals need um, from tr uh, between those two um, 
elements. Yeah. Um, it's also Lua, and it needs Lua XML, but it doesn't have a graphical user interface, so it should be fine on Windows too. Um, it's work in progress, and again, there's no documentation yet. Uh, there's a config file you need to edit. You have to place the, um, the propagation delay and speed there and such things. Um, and then you simply invoke the, the script with the um, inter, uh, interactive Lua interpreter, and then you can um, call the functions. The first function you need is um, loading the board, the eagle board, and the second function is um, this get signal delays, you can either use this without the time parameter, then it will adjust the metric distance um, between the signals um, by the um, this twenty percent factor as needed. Yeah, and um, this is good if the spec. So the spec usually says you have to do the length matching for, um, for one point five millimeters, let's say. Um, that way, you can use this to check the length matching, but usually the better thing is to um, just do the time delay. And um, this you can do with a time parameter. Um, this BGA workshop is called BGA workshop for a reason, because there is a lot of, uh, a lot of other stuff in there. For example, some um, BGA fanout helping functions and so on. Um, there's really a lot of functions which I have not documented and um, yeah, you can try to understand them. Um, it would be too much for this uh, right here. Uh, but you can also ask me, of course. So, um, when we talk about the characteristic impedance, um, the uh, high speed signals travel through co uh, a conductor like a wave. They get reflected if the end isn't properly terminated. And the reflected signal adds to the uh, next signal, basically. And um, yeah, this messes things completely up. So um, you need to calculate the geometry of the, the transmission line to match this characteristic impedance that's needed. And um, you need proper termination then. And um, you might remember this from 10 base 2, where you had those 50 ohms um, termination resistors at the ends of the coax cables. Um, yeah. When we deal with transmission lines, we have to um, consider a few more details. Um, one point is the termination, I uh, mentioned that briefly, and the other thing is the slew rate. Um, you can simulate transmission lines, and um, you can design transmission lines for a given impedance. Um, we also need to consider uh, multi-layer stack-ups for the transmission lines. Um, we'll see about this later. Um, termination schemes for the, um, for the um, uh, transmission lines are uh, mostly on die termination for point-to-point -point connections like um, LVDS. Um, Termination may be needed if you have a multipoint connector, so one transmitter and several receivers. Um, stubs you should avoid because um, you'll get reflections at the ends of the stubs, and uh, termination should always be placed after the last IC. Um, there's built in termination that's called on die uh, termination in DDR2 and DDR3, so um, this makes things uh, a bit easier. Uh, but they are only there for the data buses because the data buses are just um, point to point and clock and address lines, also the control lines, um, they are point to multi point. So um, those need extra termination usually, uh, but sometimes you can get around this um, by reducing the clock frequency. This way, the signals won't get any better, but they have more time to settle before the clock edge comes in. Yeah. It's a bit hard to, um, yeah, um, here you can see this. Um, here we have the, um, here we have this uh, signal, it's a bit, yeah, it's not perfectly rectangular. Um, so if we pull it in the length, um, we have more time um, for the signal to settle before the next edge. Yeah. Um, but usually, um, you cannot simply reduce the frequency of a transmission um, to improve the signal quality. So the signal quality doesn't change. Um, it, you can only change the, um, yeah, the errors that might be produced. Um, the thing is, reducing the frequency doesn't um, reduce the slew rate. 
and um, the slew rate is actually the, the time for the signal to go high or to go low again. And um, this, um, these parts you should, uh, always have higher frequency portions than your uh, base frequency of the transmission. You can see the spectrum of a square wave on the web. And um, the thing is we need short and fa uh, or fast slew rates um, for high frequencies. Um, because otherwise the signal doesn't reach high or low uh, state in time again. There are some more details on the web, you can look them up. Um, the slew rate you can get from the data sheets and um, for professional tools there are also IBIS files. These are um, text files, they also contain waveform data for those signals coming out of the output buffer of this chip while driving a, a certain transmission line. Um, you can read them with a text editor, you can pass them uh, with your scripts and um, they can be used to simulate and analyze signal integrity um, with a given transmission line and a given termination. Um, you can read those easily and you can use scripts to extract the waveform data and plot it in GNU plot, for example. Um, then you can simulate transmission lines um, with SPICE. SPICE is an um, electronic simulation engine, but it doesn't come with a user interface. Um, there is a free, as in beer, user interface from Linear Technologies. It's called LT SPICE. Um, you can download it here, even without registration. Um, there are Windows and OS X um, versions available. The Windows work, uh, version you can also um, use with Wine. And you can find tutorials for this on the web. Um, there are two open source projects um, for using IBIS data um, together with SPICE. Those are here. I haven't tried them yet. I just uh, mentioned them, uh, it, them here because uh, you might want to give them a try. Um, you can simulate transmission lines in LT SPICE. First, you need a pulse voltage source. It has um, rise time and a fall time or you can use a time value text file um, for this source and this um, PWL file you could generate from an IBIS file. So here you can see, um, this is how LT SPICE looks like. You have, um, here you have your schematics and here we have the voltage source, it's connected to ground here and here it's connected to the transmission line. Um, then we have a virtual oscilloscope and we can click anywhere here and inspect this uh, in the graph here. So um, green shows the signal coming out of the um, voltage source and um, pink here shows the signal at the end of the transmission line here. Um, yeah. The transmission line is called T-line in, uh, in LT SPICE. You can add those um, here with um, an add component symbol. Um, you need to set two parameters for a transmission line. One is the electrical length, it's called TD. And it's usually sufficient to simulate the longest line of a bus because um, this will be the worst case. Um, you also have to add the characteristic impedance that set, sets uh, C0. Yeah. And those are, um, you can see here, so we have 120 picoseconds for this transmission line and it's 50 ohms. And um, here we can see the parameters for the voltage source, 200 picoseconds rise and 200 picoseconds fall time, 1.8 volts, and so on. Um, you also need to add the input buffer and um, termination if there is any. Um, the capacitance of the input buffer is important. You need to look this up in the data sheet. Here we can see the, capac uh, the capacitance um, for the input buffer of an actual DDR2 RAM. And, um, this is also a very interesting thing. Um, if you increase this capacitance, the signal gets um, worse very fast. So um, when you want to measure this line um, with your oscilloscope, you will add some capacitance here and your, you will mess your signal up completely unless you have um, a good high frequency probe. Yeah. But I won't cover uh, measuring um, those um, things here because this is too difficult to do it yourself usually and it's too costly. Um, then if you have on die termination, you can also add this resistor here or if you have parallel termination, this is basically the uh, termination resistor. If you don't have any termination, it's usually one mega ohm. In LT SPICE, you need to use the um, MAC for MEGA. Um, if you write uh, simply an M, uh, it'll be milli. Yeah. So um, 
This happens if you have no termination on this line and it looks quite obscure and this is because it travels back and forth and uh, again and it adds to the new signal and yeah. And this is with a slight mismatch. So we have a, a 75 ohms transmission line and 50 ohms termination. And um, yeah, this is with 100 ohms. So um, the, uh, the characteristic impedance doesn't need to be spot on. Um, the signal actually gets worse as the mismatch grows. The specifications often allow plus minus 20% for the impedance. But of course, we try to hit the um, impedance as good as possible. Um, when designing um, transmission lines, we, um, um, we need to um, consider this. Yeah. And a transmission line, you always need a lower ref uh, impedance reference plane that could be either ground or um, the voltage supply. Ground is usually better because it has less noise. Here you can see three transmission lines. Uh, this, the first one is a strip line. It's for inner layers. The second one is the micro strip for outer layers. And um, the last one is a coplanar waveguide that can be used for analog signals, but it's not good for buses because it takes up quite some space because you need um, additional reference uh, things here. As it, well, this is a... Um, actually a ground-backed coplanar waveguide. Um, micro strips, you have a coated micro strip if you add um, solder mask above it. And um, for strip lines, there's the um, option to do an asymmetric or offset strip line if these two heights aren't um, the same. Yeah. Um, now the characteristic impedance depends mostly on the width of the conductor. So um, by increasing the width of the conductor, you lower the characteristic impedance. Uh, the next thing is the height uh, above the reference plane. By decreasing the height, um, you can also lower the um, characteristic impedance. But this depends on your multi-layer stack up. Um, there's a dielectric constant of the insulator, um, which affects the, um, the um, um, characteristic impedance. And, um, but it doesn't have such a high influence. So the epsilon R is usually 4.2. Um, yeah. I'll come back to this later. Um, differential transmission lines are edge coupled, so there's capacitive coupling between those lines, and they are often used for Ethernet, PCI Express, serial ATA, and so on. Um, they are more robust to noise, and they are driven with inverse polarity, and that's why they are more robust to noise. Um, the receiver um, only utilizes the difference between the positive and the negative um, conductor, and noise usually couples into both lines, um, more or less with the same amount, um, so the difference doesn't change. And um, you need a, character, uh, a differential impedance then, and this is usually two times um, the single-ended impedance. There are more details here, you can read this. And um, for the... Um, the differential impedance depends on the impedance of the individual lines of the single-ended impedance, and um, by lowering the single impedance, you also lower the differential impedance. Um, the distance between those conductors, if you reduce it, you'll get a lower differential impedance as well. Usually, you have a 100 ohms uh, differential impedance. Um, the trapezoid shape you see here is due to edge back um, during the production. The edge back is usually equal to the copper height, so if you have um, 35 um, micrometers, um, the upper um, width is 35 micrometers less than the lower width. Um, this affects differential pairs more than um, single-ended pairs because it affects the coupling here. Um, the epsilon R for FL4 boards is frequency dependent. Usually 4.2 is a, a good value. And um, yeah, it's, the uh, effect of a slight mismatch here isn't very high. So um, the next thing is that micro strips see a mix of solder mask and um, FL4 epsilon R. You can see this here. There's the solder mask and also there's the air above this. And um, yeah. Here are some example values for the solder mask coating. So you have 42 micrometers, for example, above the PCB and less above the conductors. Um, you can calculate um, 
the width, the height, and the um, characteristic impedance. Um, there are approximation equations for this in JavaScript. You can Google them, and here's an URL you can use. Um, KiCad has a built-in calculator for that. You can simply use this one. But if you want to be more precise, there are field solvers. Um, there's an open source 2D solver, um, and this solver actually takes such pictures. These um, pictures are input for the solver, and um, it takes Windows bitmap files. It doesn't have a graphical user interface, it's just a console tool, and it takes a while depending on the size of the image. Um, there's also MDTLC, this is free as in beer, um, a Windows graphical user interface with a uh, built-in ATLC backend. Um, it uses an older ATLC version though, um, but it's rather easy to use and it also works in Wine. Um, yeah, ATLC, I already did show you the pictures. It can calculate the signal propagation speed, the single ended and the differential impedance. Um, it has some console tools for generating those bitmaps. And you can, of course, uh, create your own graphics using GD graphics, for example. That's what I did. I'll show this. And you need the red for P and blue for N conductor and green for reference conductors. Um, you can use other colors then for insulators and so on. Um, you just need to read the documentation. Um, the only thing here is the ratio between uh, the height and the width and so on. The actual scale doesn't matter as long as it's fine-grained enough. Um, for example, one pixel for five micrometers is a good thing. Um, Larger images might be more accurate then, but you also take more CPU time. Yeah. Um, my tools are uh, still work in progress and uh, I want to rewrite them because I'm um, no longer happy with uh, how I added new stuff without um, restructuring them. Um, there's Lua code again, but no documentation yet, and it's in the same repository. Um, there's a config um, file where you, some multi-layer stack-up definitions are um, in there and the, uh, the required impedances at the end of this file, um, you need to edit these, and you can run it uh, again in an interactive session, and it'll print out um, the results using the uh, approximation questions, uh, equations. Um, it'll also generate a visualization of um, the stack up, um, and then you can use uh, this function um, to invoke ATLC, um, to generate an, uh, BMPs and run ATLC. It will take a bit more time, but then it's for the fine-grained tuning. Then. It needs um, Lua GD for the graphics, and um, it also needs convert for image magic because um, a Lua GD doesn't produce the right um, data format. Um, yeah. um, the, the units are in millimeters, and the layer ID, you need to set this to the, um, to the signal layer. Um, corresponding to the configuration file. And for example here, we want to do a um, project we name PCI Express and uh, we'll use layer two and we'll try width um, 0 0.25 and spacing 0 0.25. So here this S again is the spacing for differential lines. Um, with multi-layer stack ups is the next thing. Um, there's the height, uh, the height between um, the layers and this depends on the multi-layer stack up. Um, we need to choose a multi-layer stack up, which gives us good heights. And um, custom stack ups are too expensive. We cannot use those in do-it-yourself projects. And um, this means we need to choose our um, PCB house, which has a suitable pool process. And pool process means they um, use projects from many different customers. And yeah, um, you need to ensure your, uh, that your PCB manufacturer won't use another stack up uh, for your pool order. So talk to your PCB house before your design and before, uh, before production. And for controlled impedance, you don't need this. Uh, uh, well, no, there's a thing called controlled impedance. You can order this and then it will show you really huge prices. Don't use that. Um, it's um, for projects where the manufacturer guarantees a certain characteristic impedance. Um, this is quite expensive and it's not in the pool and we can do without this. Um, with multi-layer stack-ups, you usually want to use top and bottom for signals as long as possible. Um, that means the adjacent layers um, should be reference layers. You can see this here. We have a reference layer here and the outer layer um, 
is used for signals, then um, by putting voltage supply and ground planes um, close together, um, you create a really good capacitor for high frequency. This is something you can see here. We have the, um, the voltage here and ground there, and we have a really good capacitor. And um, the thing is, you need this layer stacks need to be symmetric. That means if you put a uh, solid plane here, you also need to put one here. Um, otherwise, it'll come to problems um, once the PCB gets produced. Um, with less than uh, with less than eight layers, the height is usually very high, and uh, this leads to rather large track widths for the um, uh, for the typical uh, characteristic impedance of 50 ohms. Uh, this might lead to spade issues um, during routing, and we need to make some trade-offs. For example, slight uh, mismatches for the um, impedances, or we need um, non-adjacent um, voltage supply and ground layers. You can see this here. Uh, the ground and the voltage supply layer are completely on the opposite side, so there's really no capacitor there. Um, but yeah, we need to make trade-offs. Here are some examples um, you can use. Um, this one is a pool stack up from PCB pool, six layer, and this one is the pool stack up from Word Direct, um, six um, layers again. And here is an eight layer um, pool um, stack up from EuroCircuits. Um, also, here you can find our slides, uh, a slide with some PCB manufacturers. They are um, mostly Europe and Germany, especially. Um, yeah, some of these have, um, for example, Euro circuits. You can directly uh, see and choose the stack up you want. Um, it'll give you um, uh, expensive prices for the non pool stack ups, but if you choose the pool stack up, they will use this one. Um, with other um, manufacturers, you should check if before that they really use this, uh, this pool stack up. Um, when doing BGAs, you, um, you usually, usually want to use dog bone breakouts. That means um, you, set, um, you divide the, the chip in four quadrants and um, add the wires for those parts um, leading, uh, facing to the edges of those quadrants. And this way you can see there is some cross in the middle um, where no wires are and you can use some, uh, you can place some um, 402 capacitors in, in here. And this works well with pitches um, of 0 0.8 millimeters and more. The pitch is the distance between the center of one pad and the center of the next pad. Um, also, you should cover the wires with stop, solder stop. This is explained here, how to do this in Eagle. Minor clearance violations are usually not a problem. Um, for example, I produced this one here with um, this clearance, while the board house only can guarantee this clearance. Yeah. And you can say it's on my risk and produce it, and it usually works. Um, design software, Eagle, I already mentioned, there's a hobbyist version um, for up to six layers. Um, now, the cool thing about Eagle is that they use XML board files. Those are easy to read, understand, and modify. You can use software to do this. In Lua, you can simply um, convert it to Lua tables. Those are nested, and later you can um, write those tables out um, as XML board files again. Um, KiCad is free and open source, and it's really great. Um, just make sure to use the Debo version, not the stable one, uh, because there are lots of new features in the Debo version. Save often and make backups, because it's a Debo version. Um, the layout um, engine is very powerful. You can push and shove. That means you can um, at the track and it'll push the other tracks away. This is great for BGAs and more complex projects. There's a built-in Python interpreter and the board files are text files. Those are easy to read, understand and modify. There's also a built-in 3D viewer. The conclusion of all this is that the lack of expensive um, professional software can be compensated for with free and open source software, custom tools and knowledge and a high motivation. You can produce a great PCBs by um, choosing the right pool process, and um, you can use this for very advanced projects. Reflow soldering is also something that can be done without expensive uh, equipment. Um, it needs some experiments and patience. So the further strategy is um, 
to invoke hackerspaces for the soldering, for example, and to improve the software for the impedance matching and so on, and to collaborate on such projects. Um, if you have more questions, um, I think we do have 10 minutes left for the questions. And um, I'm also available in the Königlich Bayerischen Amts village here. And you can also call me uh, via DECT. You have to just have to dial Hunds. Yeah. And so I'll say we start with yeah. questions. So thank you very much for that interesting talk. <laughs> Your applause. I actually think that was quite a lot of pushing with a lot of uh, physical background and knowledge you will need and not only soldering. And so building your own tools is actually quite cool and I think there for sure will be some questions here. So if you have questions, please come to the microphone in front of you and ask your question to the microphone. We still have 10 minutes for questions, please. Um, most newer BGAs have a pin spacing of 0.5 millimeters. Mm. Did you see any vendor that can produce the required um, blind wires? You need laser drill between the uppermost wires for that. Well, there are a lot of um, houses that can produce it, but they won't do it in the pool. So you have to pay them a rather large amount of money and then they will do it. Yeah. Um, I think this will change in the future because it is more and more necessary. So um, if we today we think about um, six layers, multi layers, we haven't had this in pools in about um, two years before or so. So I'm certain um, there will be some steps towards this, um, but it's not here right now. Yeah. Thank you. So the next question is. That's, that's a comprehension question, where you talked about pool stack up. Yes. As I understand it, the, the different layers are pretty much identical, so I don't quite get the point where you have to be careful about what is the pool stack up and what is not. Could yeah. you elaborate on that? Um, the thing is, here you can see some pool stack ups. Um, this one is a pool stack up from um, PCB pool, and this one is one from... Um, from uh, it's uh, um, so the same stack up, I think, um, but um, those um, build ups actually differ from the board house to board house. Yeah. So um, I don't think this is correct what I, I wrote here um, because the, this is. Yeah, I don't think this, this one is fine. Uh, so, um, and the next thing is once those. Um, you need to really um, tell them to use the, this stack up they wrote on their web page because sometimes the manufacturers, if they have a customer paying for a custom stack up and they have some place left on this board, they will put your project on this too and produce it with the wrong stack up for you. And um, for example, PCB pool sometimes uses um, a six layer stack up when you ordered a four layer um, board and um, it just won't use two of those layers, and but it obviously it will me uh, mess up your stack up then. Yeah. And, and that would uh, would produce problems with uh, with impedance within the within because the, stack, the the height will change. Yeah. Okay, we have to be a bit of load balancing for this question. So the next two questions, please go to this microphone over there. Just. More, less a question than more a small hint. If you can get a hold of a German university email address, the uh, commercial package Altium is actually available for around 100 euros a year. And compared to Eagle and Keycard, it's at least worth a try, I think. Uh, maybe in addition to the previous question, the guys from Altium uh, realized that everyone is pirating their software and they decided to um, release a free version which is called Circuit Maker. It's currently in open beta. You can already download it if you sign up at the Circuit Maker website, circuitmaker.com. And it looks pretty good actually. It doesn't have any layer or uh, component restrictions like the free version of Eagle has. Now, to come to my question, um, well, question, uh, remark actually, you mentioned the trick of creating a rectangle around packages of uh, ICs to facilitate the alignment. But I want to remark 
that um, for many Chinese manufacturers, the alignment of the silkscreen layer is not always so perfect. And I already had a few instances where I indeed used the alignment of the silkscreen. Um, and unfortunately, the silkscreen was a bit off and I didn't notice until the uh, ball grid array um, f switched uh, one row of balls, which is almost incorrectable. Yeah, there's some um, trick. You can uh, look through the balls uh, if you uh, hold it against the light and then you will see if um, they are um, slightly moved uh, against the paste. Um, but this only works as long as there are no other chips. Yeah, indeed. Thank you for the interesting presentation. So we have still four minutes left for questions. So the next question, please, to the microphone on the right hand side. I have a question about soldering. Um, do you have any suggestions for a double-sided soldering process using a reflow oven? Mm. Um, no. Usually I um, do it that way that I put all um, um, complex components like PGAs on one side and I use um, the second side um, only for components which I can um, do with hot air or um, the normal soldering iron. Yeah, then uh, I, uh, I place one side and in the oven and then I do the second side and uh, for example um, with um, paste and on a hot plate and with hot air this works well or with a soldering iron. Okay, we have time for another question or maybe another two questions, please. Um, thank you for the talk. Have you considered um, ultrasonic cleaners for stencil cleaning? Um, well, I don't, um, you should then use something else than water, I would say, because um, it might not, um, yeah, it, it depends on the paste if, if it's water solvable, I would say. Yeah. But um, the lighter fluid really does the trick for me. And there's also another um, trick you can use. Um, you can um, add round corners for those pads. You can um, adjust that in Eagle and in some other boards too, where the corners won't be perfectly 90 degrees angles, but they will be rounded and this way in the uh, corners there will be less uh, soldering paste left, uh, soldering uh, paste left afterwards. You can clean it better that way. Okay, I think we still have time for one more question. Yeah, it's just uh, uh, one thing about solar paste. Uh, maybe I missed it, but what I uh, learned about solar paste is that it uh, absorbs moisture. So if you have old solar paste, you might end up with a, with a garbled design because the moisture drives out the solar paste from the pad during soldering. So you should temper, you just uh, make the paste on your design, then put all the components, then temper it at 80 degrees half an hour in an oven. Then it's dry, and then you can uh, safely re reflow solder without having sparks of solder coming out. Um, yeah, well, the, the tempering um, is, you mean during um, not the popcorn effect, but um, for a normal. Um, well, normally you don't need this with the um, solder paste available today, so there are different um, waves um, that are recommended by um, manufacturers and there are also some waves that use a, some sort of plateau uh, here with about 100 degrees. Um, but I usually, so if you have different chips and every chip has another wave you should use, you obviously have to decide which one you use. And if the FPGA costs 50 bucks, I'll use the one from the FPGA. And it does the trick for all the other chips as well for me. So. All right, thank you. So maybe one more question. Do we have any questions left? I don't see anyone standing on the microphones here. So please give a big round of applause to Hunt for this very cool talk. Thank you, thank you very much.